Let's do the call to worship next then. Christ is risen and greets us with peace. The peace of Christ is among us indeed. We are a witness of God's glory and of steadfast love. Forming love of God among us. Indeed, come let us worship. All right, now we will do the unison prayer. God of love and light, we come as witnesses of your glory and faithfulness. Amazed to discover your transformation, love. God, we desire for you to abide within us and for your grace to be revealed anew daily. Be with us and awaken and within us the call to love one another in the way it was made real through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Will you join with me in the prayer of confession and absolution? Ever-present God, forgive us when we stand in disbelief. And comfort us when our fears outweigh your peace. God, forgive us when we become too busy to pray. Help us when we fail to see our neighbors in need. Abiding God, forgive us when we are overwhelmed with bad news down completely. In these times, remind us that we are called to be your love lived, your faithful witnesses, and your humble servants. Help us to wake the work of love to your renewing strength each day, we pray. Hear our prayers of repentance and forgiveness. Awaken us from doubt, disbelief, and distress by transforming us into your resurrection joy. God, we desire for your loving spirit to be among us. Comfort us in our fears and to renew our faith. Amen. close in the unison of the Lord's Prayer, and you may use language which is comfortable for you in the presentation of your heart when you say the Lord's Prayer. I know that some of the options are our Father or our Abba, who art in heaven, in me, and everywhere. There are other variations um, some say, instead of lead us not into temptation, they say, um, shield us from temptation or save us from temptation. Um, and some will say debts and debtors and trespasses and trespassers. All of these things are acceptable to God and they are acceptable to us because we are a diversity even in our oneness of community. Let us pray. O oh, holy and beloved God, we give you thanks for this gloriously beautiful day and all days, the days that frighten us with your strength and power of weather and rain and even tornado and the days of warmth and soft breeze. And all days are yours and we are grateful to be in them especially this day. We come together to praise you and to thank you for all that you have done for us and also to gather as community together in person and for some also electronically. 
knowing that you are present in all of these places, in all of our encounters, bidden and unbidden. Help us to be mindful of that and welcoming of you as you are welcoming of us. There are those among us who struggle, who are in pain and suffer loss and trauma and fear. Some of those we know, and some may be right here in this room and we are unaware, or only if you are aware, but you, O Holy God, you know everything about us. So we, we ask for your healing and your love, your presence and your kindness. We ask that you teach us and train us that these beautiful ways that you have will become our ways, that they will flow through us and with us and in us, in our encounters, in our daily lives, in the moments that we deem special and identifiable, and in the moments that seem ordinary and forgettable, yet none of our days are forgettable to you. And we marvel that you love us. We marvel that you came to us in the flesh. You were incarnate. You walked among us, and you talked to us, and you, you ate with us, and you grieved with us, and rejoiced with us. And you do this now, albeit not in a physical body. It help us to remember that you are there, and you are here and you are in us, and you are everywhere. And so, as you have taught us, Jesus, we are bold to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our, our scripture reading today will come from Luke 24, verses 36 through 48. And then when uh, Kimmy added 49 to 53. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you so, why are you so frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See, it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Uh, while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are a witness of all these things, and see that I sending upon you what my father has promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them as far out as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. Amen. Susan and I... Um, we operate under a system or non-system of great trust. Um, I put in musical meditation, and I never know what Susan is going to do or say, but I always know that it will be amazing and that the Holy Spirit will be present. And uh, 
Oh, you're very welcome. Sometimes I'm, I'm really quite terrified, quite frankly, which is, a, which is appropriate when talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit represents the most unknowable and feral aspect of the Trinity. And um, so much so that um, in many creeds, there is language which seeks to reign in the Holy Spirit. Um, even though with Jesse preaching on, uh, well, we'll be preaching on Pentecost, I think we will gain a greater and deeper understanding of just how wild God is. I, I sometimes call God the feral divine. And if you know how much, you all know how much I love cats. And, you off, and some of you may know my, how much I love nature. But um, a, feral, a feral cat is a source of wonder and terror to those of us who live with um, more seemingly well-behaved uh, felines. And um, a hawk, which is a wild hawk, not one that is raised in captivity, is called a haggard hawk. That is a feral hawk. And I know very little about hawks and the training of them. But I, if you've ever been to the Renaissance Festival, they have some years a lady who has hawks and she has one that is a haggard and she says that that is the greatest treasure of her life, that this feral born creature is in communion with her and lives with her. And whenever this feral creature is let to fly, she could fly away, but she has not yet. And so I would say my sermon title, Free Your Mind, goes along with that because the story of the ascension of Christ is one of the weirdest stories in the Bible when you think about it. Oh, that's okay. You know, we have our electronics which have been sustaining us through this year, and um, I have to confess my phone is on right now because I am professional staff on call. I will not run to answer it, but I was afraid that if I turned off the sound, I wouldn't turn it back on. Um, but that's probably because I am not so feral, and I seek to follow the rules of the society and the church, and also um, to be there as I have promised um, for the team that is working this weekend, should they need me. And so we, we live in a world of promises and reigning in and seeking to understand. Um, now, we have lots of teachers in this congregation, and we have lots of parents and aunts and uncles and cousins. And so you know that when a, a person is young, there are things you do not feed them. And even I, who have no children, know that you cannot cut up hot dogs in a circle. They have to be cut in smaller pieces, and that grapes also must not be given whole, um, because what we usually can eat without choking on I've, though I, I've seen adults have trouble with them too, um, but they delicious and interesting and being one of the few things that some of the children that I know will eat, um, and we have to respect that too. Um, they are cut up small so that they will not choke and get stuck in the windpipe, and um, then we will, you know, be in terrible trouble, and it would be just, it's potentially could, could kill them. Um, and at the very least, we'll have this, the trauma for them and the trauma for us of having to actually use the CPE training that we took um, to free their airway. And so I think it is with us and the event of the ascension of Christ and the fathers of the early church. 
Um, there's an interesting theory about the Gospels being written by women, um, which we may explore at another time, because women were the tellers of story, and is the bearers of story, women would have been part of the oral tradition who told these stories originally. Um, and in the, the fashion of the day, attributed them to their favorite apostle. Um, just as I sometimes will say, I will attribute something to something that my parents taught me. And um, I may use words that I learned from that encounter, but the actual words are really mine. But the teaching was theirs. And so that was the that was how it was in the first, really, to many centuries after, where authorship was not copyrighted, and they did not have a, a sense of individual ownership of ideas as we do now, but of shared ideas. And also the social um, intelligence to present the ideas in the ways that they would be best heard by the culture at the time. But one of the things that I found puzzling this week as I studied this text was that many of the scholars, um, and I tend to read for, you know, progressive to mainstream and some old school and some historical scholars, um, the closer to the Age of Enlightenment they were, they were almost embarrassed by this story. Um, they, they kind of, you know, I, I think it's strange. We, we have the arc of the Christian year, of which we are a part of, which begins with um, Advent, the anticipation of the birth of Christ, the Christ who is both fully human and fully divine, that a small baby is fully human and fully divine and is carried in the womb of a, of a young girl, a young mother, um, at the placement of the Holy Spirit of God, grows to be a man, has an earthly ministry, and um, then comes and he is tried, he is tortured and killed, and he arises from the dead. And that part, because it's part of our culture, seems very plain and simple to us. How many people here think that's a weird story? Now think about it as though you weren't raised with that. Is that a weird story? Yeah, strange, isn't it? But up to that point, we're pretty good with it. We feel pretty comfortable with it. But then we get to the part about walking around after death and not being recognized, which we've talk we're talking a lot about right now. Um, that's a little weird, isn't it? But you can kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well, God is, you know, God can do anything. God has done great things for me. Why can't he have, be walking around here and not be recognized till he wants to be? Right? He might be in the grocery store line behind you and you've never known it. I don't know. I, I could totally see him as the guy who plays high in peekaboo with the small children in the grocery cart. I mean, I, I know you're not supposed to, but... When a little person waves at you and says, hi, you have to wave back. You do. Even his mom is going, don't do that. Uh, I've even had mom say, I'm sorry. And I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. But this part about the ascension, very weird. But so weird that it is in both of the top two creeds that most of the major Christian denominations will use or reference, including the Congregationalist, who are the other major half of the United Church of Christ. Um, and I am going to just go through a version of the Apostles' Creed. And how many of you memorized it as a kid? Yeah, okay. So I may not have exactly the words that you memorized. And if you feel like chiming in, go for it. Um, I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into Hades or hell or something else that you might put in there, I learned to the dead, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost or Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church with a small C if you are Protestant and a large C if you are Roman Catholic, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yeah? Familiar, right? So tucked in there, and at the speed that we would usually say this, because when you memorize things, sometimes you talk faster, right? You get, um, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So we just zoom past that ascended into heaven part, right? It's just, we got to get it done. We want to be confirmed. We want, we want to take communion. Back in the day, that was how it was done in a lot of churches. I was Presbyterian. It was a big deal. Two years of confirmation class. And um, then the moment ruined by my friend Kathy, who was sitting next to me in the pew. And she says, oh, no. Like, what's the matter? I thought maybe she was going to be sick or something. And she says, I hate grape juice. And I said, quiet. And she said, I I don't want to drink that. I said, quiet. It comes just like it is here at Zion and usually in a big, you know, in the individual cups. And she takes one and we're all looking at it like, you know, we're supposed to, this is very, very sacred, very, very exciting for us. And we're thinking about the blood of Christ and the suffering of Christ and And also those two years of classes and the retreat where we were just idiots um, twice. And she she does a shot. She goes, oh, I drank it. Oh, that was so gross. Honest, you know. So, I mean, you know, what can I say? That is my life. Um, Just when I think I'm going to be in a very holy and sacred moment, reality enters in. And yet, you know, that is sacred too. So the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, there was a call to have a creed as early as the fourth century, but the first verifiable use of the Apostles' Creed in a form that's somewhat like this one dates to the 12th century. Now, the Nicene Creed is um, it's sometimes more formal, more liturgical churches. Um, the Episcopal Church still uses this. There's many beautiful musical settings of this by composers like Healy Willen, who's a great British church composer, and Ray Fun Williams. You know, I, hey, you know, it is a British heritage, right, Susan? Beautiful settings of this. And um, so it's a little easier for some of us because it's easier to memorize music than it is to memorize lots and lots of words. But it's really bad if you can't sing in that church. So I will not sing this for you, but the, um, this is the Nicene Creed, which covers a lot of the same ground, but it makes some very specific theological points, which we've talked about before. And it goes like this, and it is quite lovely. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, begotten, not made, that's the one there. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. And some people change out human for that. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic church, again with a small c, and apostolic church, also with a small a and a large c. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, how many of you memorized that one? How many of you had to read that in church? Uh, How many of you read that in church and thought, this is not the one I'm used to? (laughs) I, you know, I'm sensing this is one of those potato salad, mayonnaise, or miracle whip moments for some of us. Yeah? But, you know, a lot of, all of the material in the Apostles' Creed is included in the Nicene Creed. It just has these very lawyerly turns, as in the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Uh, and that's a, big, that's a big one for the theology nerds. The rest of us are like, but it happened so quickly after that we wouldn't even have noticed. Yeah? Again, reigning in the feral divine in ways that make it, help it make sense to us. Did, did that make sense to you? It made sense to me. It was clear. It was linear. It was concise. And um, it is not weird, although when you think about it, it is very strange. Like the Gospel of Luke in this story, the usual methodical, you know, we love, how many people love the Gospel of Luke? Yeah, I love it. You know, it's, it's a little more filled out, it's a little bit more poetic than Mark, and not as crazy as Matthew, and not as completely incomprehensible and um, proclamatory as John. Not as gushy as John, either. It's a lot, it's not quite, it's not quite the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post, but, um, you know, it maybe it's like um, National Geographic pretty factual. It has pictures, but if you really think about it, it's got a definite point of view. So it is difficult for us, especially, how many people like science? How many people have scientists in your family? Yeah. How many people were science teachers? How many science teachers? Math teachers? Accounting teachers? Yeah. See? Yep. So, you know, this is not logical. It's not comfortable when you really think about it. Um, But, you know, this is the guy that when he is raised from the dead, he doesn't do anything really strange. There's not like... It's strange that they don't recognize it, but he's not doing anything weird. He's doing what he always does. You know, his friends are going, walking on the road to Emmaus. He shows up and hangs out with them. Then he eats with them. This is the kind of thing that he was doing all through his ministry and life, right? Hanging out with people, eating with them, going to see them at work, bothering them at work, eating lunch with them kind of like the thing a lot of people do, like a lot of politicians, that's what they do, right? If you ever had someone running for office show up at your workplace, what do they do? They come, they meet you, they, they interrupt your day, and then sometimes they eat lunch with you. Yeah? It's, it happens. So not so weird. But he does something more in this passage of Scripture He is with them right before he leaves. It's like a big going away party. And I think he knows it, but maybe they don't. And he says, he shows how much he not only loves them, but he trusts them. And he says, basically, in the vernacular, you've been with me, you know what we do, you know what the mission is, and I'm going to leave you. And you're going to go do it now. You're empowered to do it now. Everything I do, you're going to go do. And he, he releases them. 
to do what he has taught them to do and trained them and coached them and cajoled them to do. But then he does the weirdest thing of all. He goes out to Bethany and he ascends to heaven. Now, we're kind of jaded about that. We watch a lot of movies and anime and cartoons. There's people that can fly, right? Superman, right? Superman. Um, Every superhero in the Marvel franchise just about has something like flying that they do. But back then, that was not something people did. I mean, the last person who did that was Elijah. And they're still waiting for him to come back. And you may remember when I preached on Elijah, how he kind of went on a farewell tour. And they all came together, and they all watched him ascend. And they all were probably freaked out, but they accepted it because he was just such a powerful guy, except for his son who ran after him. Elisha ran and ran and couldn't catch up with his father. So that's why at sacred gatherings for... In the Jewish tradition, there is always an extra chair for Elijah because we never know when he might be coming back, right? Jesus was even asked, are you Elijah? He's like, no, wrong guy. So he did this weird thing. And it is just really exciting when you think about it. Think about, don't think about being able to fly or go to that place in Overland Park or Lee Summit where you can fly and they put you in the big machine and you, has anyone done that? It's cool, isn't it? Yeah, Mitzi's done that. She won't be doing that this week, but she's done that. Um, But actually being lifted up, taken up into heaven, just we kind of have to suspend our belief there for a moment because we've been to the moon and Mars and we know what's up there. It's not. As far as we know, we haven't seen any angels or heaven or anything, although we have seen a lot of amazing, beautiful universe. But to find this in the Gospel of Luke, which is like the brown shoe ordinary guy gospel with a little bit of science because he was a physician, So even though physician then wasn't what physician is now, we we like kind of think he might be a kind of a scientist of his age. He was probably practical and rational. And from the gospel name for him, which continues on into the book of Acts, very much so. But I challenge you today, I challenge you to go back and read through those creeds. And for those of us here at Zion, which is a German heritage church, go on the internet and read the Heidelberg Catechism. Did you all read that here as kids? Was it referred to? Probably by the old German preachers in German because it comes out of the Lutheran tradition. Um, It's pretty cool. It, It talks a lot about who we are supposed to be as Christians, and I think it bears repeating. But I challenge you to embrace the wonder and the idea that even though we live in a rational world, that miracles do happen all around us all the time. I have seen them in the ER of the hospital. Just because you can understand the science behind it does not make it any less miraculous that a person who is brought in who is actually dead, who if you did not put electrical things on their chest and give them CPR and give them oxygen would die or has a stroke and gets the right medicine and is able to be pretty much who they were before it. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. And sometimes you may encounter miracles of the heart. And if you want to talk about miracles, talk to Greg because he has experienced many, and he is a witness among us of the feral divine. And finally, if you're, anybody here like to dance? Yeah. You can uh, pump out, you can go to YouTube and you can uh, put on that old school Spirit in the Sky song. 
and you can dance and rejoice in the miracle and amazing, amazing God who is our God and the amazing miracle that is you whom God trusts. Amen. Today we are reminded of joy, the joy surrounding the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. We remember that before the resurrection joy, these witnesses experienced grief at the cross, witnessing the risen Christ in their midst, challenges the disciples to turn their disbelief into joyful belief. Witnessing the risen Christ challenges the disciples to turn their fear into a courageous proclamation of God's glory. God calls forth a transformative love that marks a change in the ways of repentance and forgiveness. By witnessing the good news of salvation for everyone, everywhere. So let us give thanks for God's steadfast love by being witnesses to those who are hungry for food, encouragement, and relationship. Let us also witness to those who are poor in spirit by allowing God's spirit to loosen our grip on belongings and possessions in order to awaken every troubled heart. And lastly, let us offer ourselves in gratitude and with generosity as witnesses to God's goodness by our joyful giving. Let us pray. God of abundant love, we offer a portion of our time, spiritual gifts, and resources as a sign of our love for you and the world. O oh God, we give you our thanks for all that we have and ask a special blessing on these offerings. And God, we ask that our collective offering be an expression of healing that brings hope to a hurting world. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Currently, there's two ways, well, three ways you can make offerings to Zion. Uh, we have the collection plate there in the back. Uh, the address to the church should be on the bulletin. And if you go to our website, there is a PayPal option if you want to make contributions by electronic device. Hear now the benediction. Before all time, before all worlds, you were a thought of God's, and you have been brought forth even unto this day and time in that love fully revealed in the face of Jesus you and all of God's good creation are being redeemed. Amen and amen.